So our fourth segment is within the ethics of neuroscience, and it talks about ethical issues raised by neuroscience, but this one focuses on moral responsibility. Well, the next one does too. This one's gonna look at moral responsibility in a case of a person with a tumor that makes them lack control. The next one will look at the moral responsibility of psychopaths where the issue is not lack of control. I should warn you that both of these segments include some things that, that some people might find upsetting, um, but they're examples that raise uh, this very basic issue about how to treat people with brain abnormalities. The first case was reported by Burns and Swerdlow in a scientific article in 2003, and it involved Michael, not his real name. Uh, Michael was a 40-year-old corrections officer uh, who became a school teacher and got remarried in 1998. Uh, he used pornography occasionally since he was an adolescent, which was not unusual for his culture, but it had no bad effects on him or his life and he and his family had no history of any kind of sexual deviance or pedophilia or anything like that. But in the year 2000, he started to collect pornography early in the year, later child pornography in the summer. He also solicited prostitutes at massage parlors, something he'd, he'd never done before. Uh, and he said that he knew that these acts were unacceptable at the time, but in his own words, the pleasure principle overrode. And he couldn't resist that pleasure principle. Then later in 2000, I believe it was around September, he made subtle sexual advances, is how Burns and Swerdlow report it, uh, to his stepdaughter. Uh, in particular, it seems that he touched her breast in an inappropriate way. She told her mom, uh, and the mom told the police and he was brought in, uh, diagnosed with pedophilia, prescribed medroxyprogesterone, which is the chemical castration drug. He was found guilty of child molestation. And then he had to choose whether to go to jail or to enter a program for people with sexual behavior problems. Now, he knew what happened to pedophiles in jail, so he had a strong incentive to go to the program, and sure enough, he chose the program. The problem was that once he got in the program, he solicited sex from the female staff and from the other clients in the program, and they told him, if you keep doing this, we're gonna have to kick you out, and then you're gonna have to go to jail, but he didn't stop, so he had to be expelled. That means that he had to be sentenced by a judge to see how long he would spend in jail, but right before sentencing, he reported headaches, suicidal ideation, he was thinking about killing himself, lack of coordination. If you look at those little diagrams in the bottom, you can barely read his handwriting, and that picture of a clock is like really distorted. He didn't seem to be able to coordinate his drawing and writing. Uh, and he reported fear that he would rape his landlady, not desire, but fear that he would do such a thing. So his doctors ordered a neurological exam. Now, during the exam, he solicited sex from the staff. He urinated on himself with no apparent concern. So they figured there's something wrong, and this is what they found. A large, egg-sized tumor in his right orbital frontal lobe, an area that is associated with self-control, other things as well, but self-control among other things, uh, and so they took it out. And then, his sexual impulses went away, and all of his other symptoms went away. If you look at the upper right there, you can see that now he's writing very well, and he's happy that they've removed the tumor. And the clock that he drew in the bottom half of that uh, is much better than the clock at the top, so he's regained his coordination. He voluntarily even wanted to participate in a Sexaholics Anonymous program, uh, and he was found, after several months, not to pose any threat uh, to his stepdaughter or to anyone else. So he was returned home in June of 2001. And all seemed well. They were a little apprehensive, but all seemed well. In October, however, he developed another persistent headache. And again, it turned out he had been secretly collecting pornography. This time it was not child pornography, so it was not illegal. 
but he seemed down that old road and they checked and it turned out the tumor had regrown. They must not have gotten it all in the first operation. So they removed it again. Now we're in February of 2002 and his symptoms went away again, never to return, at least as of seven years later, which is the most recent report I have. The question is, is Michael responsible? Now, to answer that question, we got to first ask, which of his acts would he be responsible for? Which were the things that he did that were wrong? The main items there would be child molestation and child pornography. Most people would agree those are morally wrong. What caused him to do those acts? Well, the doctors, Burns and Swerdlow, in their articles say, and I agree, it looks like the tumor caused it because when the tumor's there, he misbehaves. When the tumor goes away, the behaviors go away. When the tumor comes back, he misbehaves again. When the tumors go away, he's back to normal. He doesn't have that, those behaviors. So it looks like the tumor is causing the behaviors. Yeah, yeah, but that's not going to get him off a of responsibility, some people say, because after all, didn't he know what he was doing? Yeah, he knew what he was doing. Didn't he intend and choose to do those acts? Yeah, when he pushed the button to download the child pornography, he knew which button to push, and he didn't push it by mistake. He pushed it on purpose to get the child pornography. So he knew what he was doing and intended it. Did he know his acts were wrong? Yeah, he said that he knew that they were inappropriate. His only claim was that he couldn't control his actions because the pleasure principle overrode his attempts at restraint, as we talked about before. So, was he morally responsible? Many people would say, no, at least he was not fully morally responsible. Maybe he was partly, but not fully morally responsible because he lacked control. It was much more difficult for him to control impulses than for us to avoid those behaviors because we don't have the impulses at all. What about the law? Should he be held legally responsible and punished? Well, here I've presented this case to a number of different groups of judges. One group of federal judges, 75% say, I don't care, tumor or not, he performed those behaviors when he knew it was wrong and uh, intended to do it. According to the law, he has to be punished. Guilty of child molestation, guilty of um, child pornography. Minimum sentence, at least five, maybe 10 years in jail for doing this. But when I did this with state judges, they were much more lenient. I think it was more like only a third of them thought he should be punished, and two-thirds thought he should be put out on probation and monitored, but, but not put into jail. So there's a large variety of views on this issue. But let's think about the people who think that Michael is not morally responsible and ask, well, what about us? If Michael's not morally or legally responsible, how can any normal people ever be morally or legally responsible? Because after all, normal people's actions also have neural causes. Our brains affect what we do, whether we've got a tumor or not. So some people say, therefore, nobody is ever responsible because when your brain makes you do it, then you're not responsible anymore. Now, I'm not going to give you a real argument. I'm just going to give you a, a dialogue, a little discussion, a fictional discussion between uh, Zena and Nick, two people who are behind this uh, beginner's guide to neural mechanisms. Let's imagine that they said this. Zena says, where were you? You promised to drive me to the airport, but you never showed up and I missed my flight. And you didn't even say you're sorry. Why did you let me down? Nick responds, don't be angry with me. I watched a movie instead. You watched a movie? What kind of excuse is that? Well, it's the newest kind, a neural excuse. I really wanted to watch the movie, and my desires are lies in my brain, so my brain made me do it. Of course your brain made you do it. It wasn't your foot. Your desires are located in your brain. So your brain made you do it. So what? What matters is which part of your brain made you do it. What made you do it was the parts of your brain that constitute your desires. 
So saying that your brain made you do it is just a fancy schmancy way of saying that you did it because you wanted to. That's no excuse. Well, but, but, but given all of my desires and beliefs, I would act the same way every time in the circumstances. Sure, but why? Only because your brain is set up so that you care more about the movie than you care about me. How is that supposed to make me any less angry? Your brain doesn't care about me or you don't care about me. Either way, you treated me like dirt. I'm sorry. Now this dialogue is not supposed to be a formal argument, but the point I hope is clear. My brain made me do it is way too general. It's not enough to say your brain made you do it. The question is which part of your brain made you do it. If a tumor made you do it, that's one thing, and that might remove your responsibility. But if your desires made you do it, that just shows what kind of a person you are and doesn't provide any excuse whatsoever. So this is where neuroscience and philosophy can work together. Neuroscience can tell us which part of the brain is involved in different types of decisions. Philosophy can establish normative standards of responsibility, and then the two can work together to figure out which people are responsible and which people are not responsible. And therefore, how we ought to react to those different people uh, when they misbehave. Uh, so that's one big issue regarding moral responsibility in the ethics of neuroscience. And now we'll turn to another. <laughs>